Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to start our sustainable practice and, and events and hospitality webinar. Um, my name is Maria del Mar Trejos. I am the senior program for the Miami-Dade Environmental Education Program at the FIU Sea Level Solutions Center in the Institute of Environment. I'm really excited to be part of this interdisciplinary collaboration, which is truly to achieve a sustainable Miami. So today I'm being joined by my director, Dr. Tiffany Truxler from Sea Level Solutions Center at FIU. We have the honor of also being with Dr. Susan Jacobson from the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications at FIU, my colleague, Alyssa Hernandez from the Sea Level Solutions Center. And today's wonderful panelists, which I'm super excited about, we have Vivian Belsagai and Dr. John Bushman as well, which they will be introducing themselves. Um, so today, in today's webinar, we have um, the option for you to ask questions. You'll be able to see them in the bottom bar um, where you can participate in our polls, in our Q&A. So if at any time you have any questions, you can go ahead and submit those um, there and we'll get to them to the panelists. So Dr. Truxler, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about our programming? Yeah, thank you, Mari. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Tiffany Troxler. I'm a, a wetland ecologist at FIU. Uh, so today's program uh, is presented by the Sea Level Solutions Center in the Institute of Environment, as Mati mentioned, as well as the Department of Journalism and Media at Florida International University. Um, and a little about the Sea Level Solutions Center, it focuses on advancing science, knowledge, decision-making, and actions toward mitigating the causes and adapting to the effects of sea level rise and climate change. And we do this through advancing um, work in research, collaboration, education, communication, and outreach. And today's program was made possible uh, by a grant from the Miami-Dade County Environmental Education Community-Based Organization Funding Program. And the purpose of the program is to increase awareness and knowledge about environmental issues, to provide skills needed to make informed decisions and take responsible actions, enhanced critical thinking, problem solving, and effective decision making skills, uh, and to help understand how to weigh various sides of an environmental issue to make informed and responsible decisions. So the program addresses four uh, priority areas of environmental education uh, in, of the Department of Regulatory and Economic Resources in the Division of Environmental Resources Management at Miami-Dade County as well as the Water and Sewer Department and the Department of Solid Waste Management. And these priority areas include water pollution, water conservation, drinking water quality, urban forestry, recycling and solid waste management, and general environmental quality. So thanks again for joining us today and we really hope you enjoy the program. Uh, thanks, Mari. Thank you, Dr. Chuckstar. Um, Alyssa, would you like to go ahead and get us started, introduce yourself and get us started with our first poll? Of course, thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa. Um, I'm the program assistant coordinator for the for this webinar. Um, so we're going to first start off with a quality of life survey. Um, these are the kind of questions that uh, uh, are pretty general. We're going to launch a poll right now, uh, and we're going to have about seven minutes for you guys to answer these. So um, please start. And has everybody? I don't know if I can see the attendees to get an okay. Um, but uh, so we have our first question. Um, I am a non-student or student. So I know we have some, some of Dr. Bushman's students here. So make sure to um, answer that. We also have the next question as type of business where I work. I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes. I'll space out my questions for you. The next question is, what are the three most important things that determine your quality of life? We do have a comment that the polls are not, you are not able to submit the polls. So essentially what you have to do is make sure you answer all the questions. And then when you reach the end, you have to scroll past that last um, answer of the last question and then press submit. If you are having issues, you can send me a personal message. I am getting responses. I'm getting results. So that means that the function is working. Okay, perfect. Who was it? The person that was not able to submit got it. Okay. 
So for those of you, number four, what are the three most important concerns that you have about sea level rise and flooding? Very applicable to Miami. <laughs> number five, what are, the most, what are the three most important concerns you have about other impacts of climate change? Very applicable to this time right now. And the last question, what do you think are the three highest priority initiatives or actions that, you can, that can be done in order to reduce these impacts and improve your quality of life? We want to hear what you guys have to say. So we have 40% of people voting. At the end, I will show the results. That way everybody can kind of get a, an idea and a feel for who we have on board today. We are at 60%, that's awesome. Just gonna give you guys a few more minutes on this. We might reach for oh, 10 minutes, so that's good. Eighty-five percent, so we're almost there. <laughs> Just going to give you guys a few more minutes. So we have three more minutes, we're at 85%. Any last um, entries wanna come in? Anybody else wanna answer? What you got, Alyssa? Just 20. I'm sorry? What you got? So we have 89%. I was about to say 10 more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you beat me to it. For people joining. Make sure yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a poll running for those of you that might have joined late. Um, going to give you just 10 more seconds for those of you that are just joining, and then we'll go over the questions really quickly. All right, guys, I'm gonna end the poll. All right, so I'm gonna share the results with everyone. We have 39% students, hi, and uh, I'm sorry, other way around, 39% non-students and 61% students, so that's awesome. Glad that we have a mix of that. Uh, mostly public, I'm sorry, private sector and others that are not working. And then for number three, the most important things that determine their quality of life, we have Oh, my screen. We have health, family, and friends, and happiness. I think we all share the same kind of morals. That's awesome. Um, we also have for the sea level rise and flooding concerns, mostly the lack of awareness, which is really good. That's why we're here to just, um, teach you guys. We also have like water contamination, so that's good. And um, what are the mo three most important impacts and concerns of climate change? So they increase heat and extreme heat. I know that that is extremely applicable to Miami. Um, and the last one for number six, the increased use of renewable energy. That's really important. Also the increase of city and community initiatives that support household activities. 
Awesome. So, Mari, you can take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa, and thanks for everyone who participated. So let's get started with our educational portion of this. Let me go ahead and stop sharing uh, the screen. Alyssa, did you get your reports needed for the yes. poll? Awesome, yes. excellent. So I'm just going to go ahead and close that. Okay, so the question, right? Like, what is sustainability and how can we achieve sustainability? So we all know that sustainability is complex. So we're going to try to break it down as much as possible. Um, what I want to tell you is that sustainability focuses on meeting essentially the needs um, of the present without compromising the future uh, generations to meet their needs. So essentially, how do we manage our resources um, so future generations have a good and stable life? And how are we can be smart and efficient in the way that we, we do things. So the concept of sustainability is composed of the three pillars. And one of my favorite things to say is like, if one, think of it as a table. So if one of it is wobbling or one is shorter than the other, then essentially the other one's not going to be stable nor efficient. So the three pillars that you can see here are social, environmental, and economic, but they're also known as people, planet, and profit. So um, like I said, you want to make sure that these are balanced so we can all uh, basically achieve our sustainability. So these are all things that are interconnected. So we must consider the impacts on a larger construct. So the key is to keep in mind um, that these, all of these things are interrelated for the rest of the webinar. So you can understand and kind of start connecting the dots between the behaviors and what's going on in, in our environment. So to achieve sustainability, we implement something that's called adaptive management. So this essentially helps uh, the business become more climate savvy by creating design and critical planning, which we'll go um, over today with Vivian. She's gonna tell us a little bit more about like how do we plan like these sustainable events. And these are practices that you can take anywhere you go. Maybe if you're doing like a birthday party or catering, like, hey, you can always apply some sustainable stuff in your events. So. Um, so we also will go over what closed loops the cycles are um, with food recovery. So Dr. Bushman is going to talk to us more about like food recovery that we can do. And this is essentially a production process in which post consumers waste is collected like recycling and adapting best management practices and implementing in innovative technology. So a lot of exciting things we're going to learn today. Um, let me go ahead and move forward to this next slide. Where's my mouse? There it is. All right, so climate change. I'm sure a lot of you already know like the basis of climate change, but let's go over them very quickly. Um, so climate change, we, we, have, um, we have seen how these three pillars like interconnect. So there are a number of human activities that are affecting the whole system, which are creating imbalances um, while accelerating. So the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and the fact that we're depleting our natural resources much faster than they can naturally replenish are some of our biggest concerns. So the behaviors and activities um, increase the release of carbon dioxide, which is the CO2, and methane, which is CH4, and nitrous oxide, N20. So which are the, these are heat trapping gases in our atmosphere, which are increasing the greenhouse effect. Um, so where essentially the sun, the sun rays get trapped into this atmosphere and they cannot reflect back into space, increasing the global temperature. So this is a diagram that you see on the right hand side when we have excess CO2 or this greenhouse gases, it kind of creates this red layer um, that doesn't allow the sun rays to reflect back. And so it, again, it just warms up the, gl the globe. Um, so in the bottom, you can see how it's basically by human activity that this has been increasing. And you can see the carbon dioxide over time and the methane release over time in the bottom graphs. And so what happens with these greenhouses? What, why does the globe get warmer? And what, how does this affect our, our climate? So essentially the CO2 that is released from the burning of fossil fuels is causing the oceans to get warmer and acidified. And so here on the right hand side, you can see the coral reef uh, bleaching. So essentially our coral reefs are dying because they're acidifying. Um, the warmer temperatures are causing our glaciers to melt, which this is causing like sea level rise. And we can see how we are getting stronger storms and our floodings are increasing. 
And another interesting fact is that salt water is, we have salt water intrusion. So essentially salt water starts pushing into the land and it can start affecting our aquifers and ecosystem, which is something that we've already seen. So our drinking water options or amounts starts like depleting. Um, and a warmer atmosphere leads to more extreme weather, weather. so we do have um, a longer duration and frequency of heat waves. And so what we can do is essentially reduce this greenhouse emissions. Um, we can switch to clean energy and we can also participate in our citizen science events around our local communities. Um, okay, so here we have a diagram on pretty much the natural resources uses. Like I mentioned before, we are indeed depleting our natural resources much faster than they can naturally replenish. And this does have to do with population growth and the increasing demands and the kind of lifestyle that we're carrying. Um, and so you can see in the diagram that by 2030, it's starting to get, we're going to start getting those concerns about do we have enough water uh, to supply everybody. And you can also see here in the bottom, the food systems across the world account for more than 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So food is super important. I definitely encourage all of you to dive a little deeper into of what's going on with our food production. And remember that um, to get food from one state to another, it takes transportation, right? It takes, it releases um, CO2 gases, which is one of the greenhouse gases. So we do, really do start have to think, um, where does my food come from, right? Um, how many gases am I actually being released by eating this product? Can I shop local? Um, so some of the things to keep in mind. And, um, so yeah, so uh, food systems also use a majority of freshwater resources and do contribute to deforestation and biodiversity loss. And you can see some of the diagrams here considering in 2030. So yeah. All right, this is probably one of my favorite things to talk about. When I started, when I first started learning about climate change, I was like, okay, well, what about the nutrients? Like, where are nutrients coming from? And like, why, what is, what, how am I getting like algae blooms? Why is this happening? So this slide in particular has a lot of information. So I definitely, you can take screenshots to refer back to. So we're going to talk about fertilizers and fertilizers uh, contain nutrients such as phosphorus and, and nitrogen. So they're, when they're applied in excess during like agricultural practices and food production essentially, and residential activities are as well in our lawns, these um, unnatural loads of nutrients can result in runoff and leaching into our waterways, creating natural imbalances. So sometimes we have like this sprinklers that have um, fertilizers in them, but then the wind hits and then so they take these little particles away. And then so that's another way of leaching uh, fertilizers in our lawns. And essentially when it rains, um, if you are irrigating and then rain comes and then you had just irrigated, there is like the water um, ends up running into our stormwater drains and these go directly into our water bay, waterway. Something to keep in mind is that uh, storm drains do not get treated. So essentially what goes down the storm drains goes directly into our waterways. And so if they contain nutrients from fertilizers or debris that they've collected along the way, they'll probably end up in our waterway. So um, something to keep in mind here is that the 30% of food produced for human consumption is essentially wasted. Um, so we are, in a sense, applying fertilizers in vain. Um, so when food scraps or other organic matter decomposes in our landfills, they generate methane gas. So one way to divert um, food from landfills is by donating to food banks, shelters, or even composting, which composting, you can do it yourself or you can take it into a community composting site, which I'm sure Dr. Bushman will talk to us a little bit more about that. Um, so just hang on, you'll learn more about it. And landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in the US. So essentially we really want to divert as much waste as possible, whether it's solid, organic, from our landfills that way we don't have to deal with this emissions or high and um, greenhouse gases. And so, uh, like we mentioned before, you want to save some carbon emissions from processing um, and transporting food from one side to another. 
Um, okay, so climate change. Let's talk a little bit about solid waste and marine debris. So plastics are made uh, from petroleum. So these are producing more carbon dioxide emissions. And something to keep in mind here in Miami-Dade is not all plastics or not everything that says recycle is recyclable. You really have to take into consideration um, what your local uh, facilities accept. And you, when we go into like, I don't know if you live in an apartment, but sometimes in these apartments we have these blue bins or even in your homes and they have this sign of, please don't throw so-and-so. And a lot of people are like, whatever, like one plastic bag isn't gonna do anything. But imagine if all plastic bags that are not being recycled into single stream recycling to just blue bins get there. So sometimes these batches of recycled materials get rejected by the facilities. Essentially, we're not gonna be able to recycle that batch. So this is something to consider when we want to educate our, our attendees or even our friends that come home, be like, hey, please put that in the right bin or, you know, hey, I compost this. So Vivian will talk to us more about that one as well. Um, so I wanna say, say no to single use plastic. Why? We don't need it. Just say no. Um, and when it comes to events, you can sell reusable water bottles or cups, or you can even recycle these materials um, or use recycled materials, I meant. Um, so storm water, we talked about that. It pretty much picks up the debris and uh, along the way, and they can end up in, um, in our waterway. So some a, a fun um, fact you can see here is by 2050, plastic in our oceans will outweigh fish um, it predicts a report from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So that was very alarming for me to know, like what, there's gonna be more plastic than fish in the ocean? I never even dreamed of that, but that's gonna happen in our generation. So like I said, most marine, uh, most plastic do end up in marine debris. All right, so, so we're in for an exciting conversation here with Vivian. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to you and please do tell us how can we become a little bit more sustainable? What practices do you suggest for our events, our homes, hospitality, restaurants, anybody in the industry, please go ahead and let us know. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Maria, and, and everybody on the team. Um, yeah, so kind of taking all of that information that we just learned or that a lot of us in here probably already know a little bit about. Uh, what I work on is more of the practical application of how we can figure out, uh, you know, kind of element by element in our events, how to uh, be more sustainable. So um, before we get into kind of the, the details of that, uh, something that I love for all event organizers or, or hotel managers or anybody really who, who hosts an event, even at your home, um, something to think about is that uh, you know, each event has and creates its own community and its own impacts on uh, their community. And so that community can, you know, that word kind of, uh, um, you know, becomes uh, something that, that's unclear. And so I really want to clarify that, you know, your community can go both internally and externally, specifically when you are an organizer or a manager or, you know, acting on behalf of a company, uh, your community uh, first starts internally, right? It starts with, you know, the top of, you know, whoever's in charge in your organization, and then it trickles down into your employees and staff, then your vendors, and then your attendees out into your community and out to the planet. So we love to look at this because every time that an event organizer makes a decision on how something is going to run at the event, it really has a ripple effect that goes out all the way out to the, the local community and to the planet. But the way that we start to turn that around is internally first. So, uh, you know, on the left, you see just kind of like a, an example of a positive ripple effect, right? If the event organizer really takes on sustainable values and tells their staff and employees, hey, this is important to us, we're going to continue doing this moving forward, please communicate that to your vendors, then all those employees and staff communicate that to the vendors and the vendors now understand and, and get educated on how things are going to work. And then that, it, it translates into the attendees experience. And then it, when the attendees experience this and, and get engaged and, and really participate in this, that's where it has the opportunity to really go outward into the community and have a positive effect on the planet. So uh, we like to keep this in mind as we're kind of thinking, you know, before we go into the, the doing of uh, all of the sustainability initiatives, how we're 
we're kind of looking at the overall uh, community. So looking into kind of the key ways that an event can become more sustainable and each of these kind of has, you know, a full rabbit hole that you can go down of things that you can do, but these are just kind of some top line tips and things to think about. The first thing we really want to think about is preventing pollution, right? As Maria was just discussing, uh, marine debris is a huge issue. It's, it's uh, the problem really, really comes from plastics and so many events because they're inherently you know, a, a temporary thing uh, become really dependent on plastics and disposables. And so a lot of these things can become uh, uh, marine debris, they can become pollution in our parks. Um, and, and then a lot of things also that can become pollution are things that attendees actually bring in themselves. For example, cigarette butts or gum wrappers or things that just come in people's backpacks or, or you know, purses, those things can end up on the ground too. So um, because this is a, a thing where both the organizer and the attendee have to kind of do their part, it's important to have a really present uh, preventing pollution campaign before and during the event as well as after. So some of the, some tips for this that, that can be done um, are, you know, first thinking about your internal uh, community, going and putting in bands such as we're not allowing styrofoam, we're not allowing single-use plastic, confetti, glitter, balloons, all these things that we know can easily become marine debris. But then also communicating that out to your attendees and saying either we're not allowing this or we're begging you not to use these things, um, you know, or to check, you know, something that I do before I go to an event is I check my, my clothes or anything that I'm wearing to see if anything sheds off of it and can easily become micro litters. Um, and then another thing that's that's more on the on the organizer side is to hire a reliable cleaning company and make sure that the cleaning company understands how important this is to you because in a lot of cases cleaning companies will understand of course we have to pick up cups and you know general trash but they're not really looking for those really micro litter pieces that are the ones that can be most damaging for the environment particularly if they end up in our waters and the ocean. Uh, another piece, sorry, if we can go back one quickly. Um, so one, one thing that I wanted to highlight here is a campaign that we did for a local event uh, called Rockastella, which happens at Virginia Key Beach Park, one of the most beautiful parks that we have here in Miami. Kind of looks like this, what I have behind me on my background. Um, so one of the things that we did is we put this campaign into action and we called the overall campaign Keep Her Wild, that was kind of our overall, uh, you know, message around sustainability. But the, uh, you know, we use the Leave No Trace, uh, which is which is kind of really well known as, you know, a, a preventing pollution campaign. And we made sure that this was communicated in advance of the event, as well as in signage, as you see here. And then in the picture on the right, we actually had, uh, in our second year, uh, we changed the Leave No Trace campaign to Leave Only Footprints, because we wanted to make it something unique uh, to the event. And um, in doing that, we had a full Leave Only Footprints team. And so this team had these yellow t-shirts on that said Leave Only Footprints on, on the back, Keep Her Wild on the front. And they went around doing what we call the dance and cleans. They went out into the dance floors and had people actually you know, pick up uh, trash with them and, and just kind of got everybody engaged into uh, into the movement. So that was really fun and an idea I wanted to share. All right. Um, so on waste reduction, again, there's, there's so deep that you can go on this, uh, but I wanted to call to mind the, you know, the, the waste hierarchy, right? So first and foremost, we want to reduce. We want to try to take that waste out altogether. If there's a, a whole thing that you can remove from the waste stream, for example, plastic cups, um, you know, force everybody to either bring or buy a reusable cup, that's eliminating and reducing an entire uh, element from your waste stream. Or you can reduce the quantity. Um, so, so that's always the first thing we want to try to do. And then you can go into reusing, repurposing, repairing, uh, anything that, that can take the materials after they're used and then give them a second life or hopefully a, a permanent life uh, where they won't be uh, disposable. Then and only then, when you've done those first two things and made sure that you can try to find, you know, ways to to uh, repurpose or to uh, 
um, you know, to reduce those waste streams, you can look into recycling and composting. And as Maria said, this is a really, uh, you know, um, sensitive process and needs to be done specifically for the, uh, uh, the um, uh, facilities that are in the local area. And only then after that, you can go into energy recovery or landfilling at the very uh, last option. You can go to the next slide. Then in nature conservation, you know, these are these are always fun things that we can do to kind of engage the community and, and build awareness around what ecosystems are present, uh, what we can be doing to protect them. For example, doing beach cleanups or restoration projects, having tree plantings, things like this. It's always fun and a great way to have an extra engagement with your attendees um, for the for uh, nature conservation initiatives. Then natural resource management. Again, this is something that we can go so, so deep into, but this uh, speaks to not only uh, conserving natural resources, but also using them in ways that are the least impactful on the environment. So of course we want to conserve water, conserve energy, uh, try to do things as, as minimally as possible, but in the events that we can't, you know, completely reduce those, that consumption, then we want to look at ways that we can use renewable energy or that we can um, use recycled products. Uh, this is where it gets into responsible sourcing, where you could, um, you know, make sure that your papers, for example, are, are uh, sourced responsibly or that your food is coming from, um, you know, a local source um, or, or that it's organic or vegan and has the least possible impact on the environment. And then community engagement. This is my favorite. So um, you know, some of you may be familiar with this campaign uh, that we put together for Ultra in 2019, and then we're starting to do for 2020. Uh, this is the Mission Home campaign. So this is a great example of a campaign, like a full marketing campaign that was put behind the sustainability initiatives. And what's important to note here is that the sustainability initiatives were decided first. First, the organization said, we're taking this on. These are all of the things we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we do them properly, and then we're going to communicate them. So uh, it, it's just important to make sure that you don't over communicate um, that, uh, you know, what you're doing from a sustainability perspective or that you don't over promise or say you're going to do things and then don't do them. Um, but then once you really have that solidified, you can, uh, um, you know, go ahead and, and kind of you know, shout it from the rooftops and, and say to the world what you're doing, because this is the part where you can really get your attendees and your community engaged in, in your program and also um, where you can take credit for all of the awesome things that you're doing for the planet. And then finally, the elephant in the room, public health. Uh, uh, you know, we're all dealing with this crazy COVID-19 uh, situation and uh, um, so much of us in the events industry and in the hotels industry have been told that now because of COVID-19, we have no choice but to move back to disposables. And that's simply not true. There are hundreds of health experts that have signed off and said, you know, reusables are absolutely as safe, if not safer in some cases than disposables. Reusables can be, you know, easily washed. And as long as they're properly sanitized, there's, there's really no concern there. Um, so I just wanted to bring this up because it's something that we should keep in mind, um, you know, that there's ways to be both healthy and sustainable. Um, another good example of that is if you have hand sanitizing stations instead of handing out individual hand sanitizers. This cuts down on your single-use plastic, and as long as you have them well stocked, then people will have unlimited access to hand sanitizer. And then finally, just taking a look back, thinking about um, you know, again, that, that ripple effect on your community, um, you know, th this is where you can decide whether you have a negative impact or a positive one. And, and really, again, thinking about how, um, you know, each, each small decision really does ripple out past your community into the planet, it's important to just keep these things in mind and, and you know, always have the intention of having a positive impact. That's it. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was very You're so good. welcome. Alyssa, would you like to go on? Hi, everyone. Again. <laughs> so we're going to launch our second poll. It's uh, basically we want to know how we did teaching you the information. 
So I'm launching it right now. It's just five questions, less, um, less choices than the last. Uh, the first starts off with a true or false question, if carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Uh, the second question, uh, what activity contributes to the third largest source of methane in the United States? Number three, how can composting reduce impacts of global change? So for example, with climate change or altered nutrient cycles. Now this, and this question number three, you can choose multiple answers. Number four is a true or false as well. Stormwater, run, uh, stormwater runoff picks up nutrient pollution and debris along the way ending up in our waterways and our oceans. And number five, would you plan to implement one of these activities you learned about and would you record or report it? This actually introduces us to our next section of the webinar. Uh, so yes, essentially if you would use a phone application um, to track and report such activities that we've been promoting today. So we're gonna give you about one to two more minutes on this. So far we have 43%. Remember to scroll all the way down in order to press submit. We should have the Jeopardy uh, theme song playing in the background. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing to have for our next webinar. <laughs> Give them some elevator music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we've gotten a lot of responses, so that's awesome. We are at 60% now. And it looks like we did a good job teaching them. High five, everyone. <laughs> we still have some, some portion to learn, some questions to ask. So definitely go ahead and get those questions in if you have any questions whatsoever, whether it's about climate change, some science behind it, or any um, recommendations that you'd like us to give you on best management practices for whether it is your next event or restaurant, you can type them in the Q&A. And if you have questions on, I'm sure, Vivian's experience and all her, her time doing what she does, that's, those are good questions to direct to us too, direct to her. All right, we're at 66%, so I'll give, I'll give one more minute and then we'll move on. It's okay if you don't know an answer, just educated guesses. We won't judge you. <laughs> not a quiz, not a quiz. Do you wanna go ahead and share some of the results? Yes, so we're at 70%. You want me to end it? So thank you for those that answered. All right, and I will share the results. So for true or false, so number one, yes, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Number two, correct, organic waste in landfills is the um, third largest contributor of methane in the United States. Then like we said, number three is multiple choice. So we have 83% answered. Composting decreases landfill waste and methane emissions. For number four, true or false, correct. Everybody 100% selected true. And for number five, we have some good feedback that 54% would use a reporting device and others would implement, 43% uh, would implement the activity, but we understand sometimes it's hard to report things. So awesome, thank you so much for everyone. I'm gonna stop sharing the results. Mari, can you stop sharing it so I can take pictures? You got it. Thank you. Thank you everyone who participated. And now we're gonna tell you how you can actually get involved using our MISA and Resource Monitoring app. We have Dr. Susan Jacobson. Would you like to introduce us to what you've been working on? I think you're on mute. So hang on one second, let me unmute you. 
or maybe you can unmute yourself. Perfect. I, I'm now unmuted. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so we've been working on a simple application where you can record, you can document your composting and recycling and landfill. And you can reach this application at nissan.miami slash monitor or at miamistories.net slash monitor. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. The, the QR code here will take you to the site. The URL is down at the bottom, but I'm going to share my screen. I cannot share the screen while the other participant is sharing, however. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay, so this is the Nissan Resource Monitor. We have three sections, one for composting, one for recycling, one for landfill. We have some instructions, and it's very basic. You enter your name, your email. We will only contact you if we have any questions. Um, the date that you are documenting your composting, recycling, or landfill how many days this is the composting monitor, how many days of compost this is, and your location. So when you open the monitor, when you open this little application, you might first see a pop-up window that says um, um, uh, miamistories.net wants to know your location. Just say yes, it's just for purposes of putting your, uh, putting this little pointer here where you're located, I'm located in the Aventura area. But if for some reason you don't see your location here, you can enter a location. So I'm going to enter um, FIU's BBC campus, which is at 3000 Northeast 151st Street. There we go. So if you don't see your location here, you can enter it here. And if it still doesn't work, we have a place in the bottom where you can, at the bottom of the form where you can tell us. We want you to try to weigh your compost. And we have a little video in the instructions that will show you how to do that. Uh, we want you to estimate the volume of your compost and um, the unit of measurement that you're using. And in the, in the instructions, we have a video and some instructions on how to do that. Um, how did you determine the volume? Um, take a picture of your lovely compost, recycling, or landfill. Um, and if it's composting, what is your method? Uh, did you use, these are ways that you can compost. Personally, I live in a condo. My method is to take the compost to the composting center. All right. Um, and if you take it, where did you send it? And if there's anything else you'd like to tell us and click submit. Now, let me show you just a couple things here. So when you submit stuff, we get lovely images of everybody's um, compost and recycling and trash from around, I'm sorry, and excess resources from around uh, Miami-Dade County. So here's a lovely image of someone's compost. And here's some images of recycling and um, landfill resources. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to gauge where, what people are doing around the county and, um, and, and where um, people are engaged. All right, so again, this is at nissan.miami slash monitor, or you can do miamistories.net slash monitor. Um, it's also available via a link on the Nissan Got Miami website. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm sure you can see my screen now. You can see it. Perfect. All right. Yes. So, yes, you can scan um, with your camera and your mobile device to access the resource app. And you can also participate in our next citizen science event. So, we also have a link and a form in the homepage on their projects for you to be able to sign up with your email if you want to participate. Um, we'll be really excited to let you know when we'll be hosting our next citizen science event. And let's get started with my favorite part, asking questions to our amazing panelists today. Um, we received some of you guys' questions, so thank you so much. We were able to pull some of them here into our screen. Um, and so these are pretty much what we will be talking, but everyone's welcome to introduce more questions in the Q&A. So let's go ahead and start with this first question here. Um, and either it could be Vivian or John, please let us know what you think. Um, how have events traditionally been held and how have they been wasteful? How problematic um, they are for the environment? And I know we talked about it briefly, but can you let us know uh, from your experience. Um, well, I think we can probably both hit on this one, Vivian. Um, but from my perspective, I would say that, you know, uh, 
meetings, large meetings, shows, exhibitions, events, uh, the event planning uh, industry, event planners in general, we work with enormous sort of to-do checklists, a million things, a million uh, items that have to be uh, done in, in a certain order. And uh, these checklists have very short timelines. And so there's this tendency to, uh, you know, always be on, on the run behind the gun and uh, uh, trying to get all these things done and sort of giving a no or a low priority to sustainability or social issues of social responsibility for our events. So, um, you know, we've seen, for example, at South Beach Wine Food Festival, it takes a good two weeks to build up uh, the infrastructure for the event and takes less than 24 hours to break it all down. So in that breakdown, you've got an enormous amount of material going in every direction and it needs to be gone within a certain number of hours. I'm sure Vivian has to deal with the same issues with her events. So, um, you know, it has, there's a lot of potential for capturing these things for reuse and recycling. Uh, I don't know, Vivian, you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you hit it right on the head with the time. You know, the time is what really just gets in the way. Um, people feel like they don't have time or they feel also like they don't have energy, like they're tired after the event and we just got to get this out of here. I don't have time to think about where it's going. I'm just doing the easiest thing. Um, you know, and, and the sad thing is that if there's just a little bit of effort put in advance of the event, and somebody will actually be there to, you know, take it off your hands and, and do your work for you, you know? So, so that's what I really like to remind event organizers is, is yeah, it feels like you don't have time now, but actually this could save you time on the flip side. And then for years to come, you might not even have to worry about this if you work out partnerships that make sense, right? Yeah, and I don't know if it's part of one of the questions here I'm scanning down, but um one of the smartest things an event planner can do is start a, a green team or a social responsibility team, whatever you want to call it, very early in the planning and assign the, assign the task of supervising those things to someone who isn't under the same timeline. So maybe you've got someone who's involved in registration, ticketing, something like that, and their job is, is largely finished uh, before, uh, you know, by the time the event is winding down, uh, that person may have the time and energy and interest to, to shift over to making sure some of these things are taken care of. Absolutely. And then to answer the second part of the question of how problematic these events can be for the environment, I mean, if you think about it, especially on these events that are large scale, you know, one event can create more waste in a few hours than someone, like one person could create in their entire lifetime. I mean, it is, uh, you know, not just from the waste, but also from the carbon footprint, from you know, the energy usage, the water usage, how much pollution might be left behind. I mean, this is, is really, you know, like if an entire person, you know, for their entire lives did everything wastefully, an event might trump that on, uh, you know, in just a few hours. So it's just something right. to think about when it comes to scale. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so something I also wanted to ask is basically, um, well, what are some trends that you've seen or maybe some misconceptions you find business owners or festivals organizers um, when they're trying to become more sustainable? And as I address one of the questions that we got in our Q&A, um, we know that there's a lot of new technology, right? Um, so how can we help businesses maybe um, start connecting to the new technology that's coming? Um, I think sometimes we we may explain that climate change is like as a negative thing, knowing that maybe other states are progressing at a much faster uh, rate in, than Florida, but how, how can you see that we can maybe also um, bring some of the trends that are going in different states to Florida? And I think you've mentioned that with renewable energy, and we had talked about maybe like lowering the cost, but if you can type it. Um, I know that was a long question, but maybe we can <laughs> also like talk about that. So from my perspective, I'm, I'm always focused on food and uh, the largest misconception is that you cannot do certain things with food at the end of an event, that you can't donate them to shelters <coughs> and, uh, and food banks and food pantries. And that's a total misconception. There are laws in place uh, here in Florida and nationally that cover all states in, in, in the country that protect you from liability for, for donating in good faith. Uh, so that's a huge misconception when it comes to food, and it blocks a lot of uh, 
organizers from even uh, attempting to do something with that. Um, and uh, I would say as a trend, the trend is that uh, people are getting educated on this. And uh, uh, not only that, uh, if the event organizer is not, uh, not uh, already educated on, on those laws, a lot of event goers or vendors or other types of stakeholders in the, in the programming are uh, asking about it and in some cases demanding uh, that, that this, uh, you know, for all the reasons that you've laid out here in this wonderful presentation earlier, you know, that the, nothing ever good happens when you throw away food. Yep, agree. <clears throat> um, you know, from a misconception standpoint, I think like we already touched on the time is a big misconception in a lot of cases. This can save you time if you, you know, put the right person in place to manage it for you or, or find the right partnerships. Another huge one is money. People automatically think that sustainability is going to cost more and in many cases it's cost saving or even revenue generating. Um, you know, and then looking into the trends, I mean, I, I think the biggest trend that we're seeing is that young people all over the world really care about sustainability. Um, yeah. You know, I, I saw a, a report in the last year that said 73% or something like that of millennials are really willing to not only spend more money on a sustainable product, but also to participate in, you know, sustainability programs. And so, um, you know, I think that this just comes to, to find that there's so much, um, you know, marketing and, and community engagement opportunity in sustainability because young people really care and because you are, um, you know, developing a, a, an audience that's going to be with you for, for a longer period of time. So I love to look at it that way. Thank you. Um, and John, I know you've worked with local organizations. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience um, working, diverting food from landfills? I, we have a couple pictures from, from the events you've been working on. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, well, tell us more about that experience. How are you making it happen? So we're, we're going on, I think, 15 years of experience at the South Beach Wine Food Festival with, with uh, figuring out ways to, to better divert um, food from waste. And uh, the most important thing, very high on that, uh, on that waste hier hierarchy that Vivian showed, there's also a food waste hierarchy which follows the same track. Um, you know, once, once you've done everything you can for reducing uh, waste at the source, the most important thing is to preserve those, that, that food and, and get it into the hands and mouths of people who can really, really use it. And uh, those people are the food insecure of South Florida and the homeless of South Florida. They're the most in need. So we established relationships with Feeding South Florida, the food bank, major food bank of this area, and in particular with Miami Rescue Mission and Broward Outreach Centers as places that this food could be turned around and used right away. Um, this is another, uh, this particular slide is another way to reduce uh, waste without even getting uh, as far as, um, as, as some of the, the lower parts of the triangle there and the digestion and the composting. Uh, so if you, if you have food scraps and things that you can't efficiently donate to those organizations for the food insecure and the homeless, uh, get them into a composting facility like we're developing uh, on both campuses at FIU, we're developing now the Living, Living Laboratory, cooperation with, uh, this is a, 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 with our College of Arts and Sciences. We're also looking at ways to bring in uh, hydroponics and aeroponics into our teaching. Uh, Vivian was talking about local foods and organic foods. These are great ways that you can, you can teach um, hospitality and other students to, to be engaged in, in this practice from the very beginning. Um, so as far as other organizations you have, we've worked with um, the food companies, they do food shows. There's an enormous amount of food left over from these and in their general operations, uh, uh, having relationships with these organizations, having these people on speed dial with a personal relationship where you can make a quick call, what can I do with, with all these uh, huge amounts of food, mobile school pantry in Broward, the South Florida Hunger Coalition. These are different organizations we've worked with. Uh, there's a couple of apps. Uh, you were mentioning apps earlier, Susan. Um, there's uh, Food Rescue US has developed a, a very efficient app uh, and they have a chapter here in Miami and uh, Feeding South Florida has developed an app, uh, part of their nationwide effort called uh, Meal Connect. And so uh, it's another way that you can uh, make a connection between food that's left over from a, an event or any type of hospitality operation 
um, and a uh, you know the donor and the donee and, and a way to transport it in between. Does that help? Did yeah, I absolutely. The <laughs> I'm also interested in knowing when, um, like, doing transportation more efficiently. I believe you yeah. mentioned something with Vivian during the Ultra Music Festival and, like, loading the carts right on time. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yeah, so I think the first slide that you put up there showed one of the golf carts. And so we, um, at the festival, we have uh, a, 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 an entire team of of golf carts moving around for different purposes. And so what we did was figure out what times are they busiest and what times are they not that busy. And we were able to sort of organize the food recovery uh, uh, at times when, when those carts became available. So there was no extra cost involved. They were already on site. It was just a question of talking to the right logistics people and getting the permissions to use those that we could move food uh, uh, faster and more efficiently. And then another important method in, in dealing with all that is, uh, is having a good team of volunteers, as you saw a lot of my students in some of those slides. Um, the generation is engaged and it doesn't take much to, to show them uh, you know, what we can do, what a difference we can make in the community by practicing these things. So we did get a question in the Q&A that has to do with the, the food. Um, and so more of the composting. Uh, do we have any information regarding any county regarding the implementation of commercial composting facilities in Miami-Dade County? I know, Mari, you've done a few um, webinars on composting, um, but I'm not sure if John has a few comments no, on that. I, I've worked with Fertile Earth Foundation, but I'm not that familiar. And, and of course, what we're developing at FIU, which is more internal, um, but beyond that, so I know at the moment we right. have, thanks. So I know that at the moment Miami-Dade does not have a composting facility. Um, there is a lot of um, organizations that are doing their own compost, um, which is what we would recommend to connect at the moment. Um, but we definitely want for people to get a little bit more involved um, and definitely get their voice out there. So you know that you can always go to your local politicians and request these things. Um, and that's way we can, you know, make a little bit more of a movement here. Um, but I, we're a little bit low on time. We have about three minutes left. Um, if there's any other questions do anybody wants to submit, we can take a look at we those. We do have another question. So we have, um, what is the South Beach uh, Food and Wine Festival doing to reduce single plastic use? Uh, the person, uh, Luis Rodriguez's suggestion was presented to the city of Miami Beach um, to stop providing attendees single plastic use and instead replace it with bamboo um, uh, utensil set and cups. Right. So what, one of the interesting things about the, the festival is that it's a wine and food festival. We put the wine uh, first in the name and so attendees are actually using glassware, um, which of course is reusable uh, all along the way. Um, the difficulty I think comes with, uh, with water. So when you're, when you're trying to uh, uh, efficiently work with water with 65,000 people and uh, uh, four city blocks on the sand of Miami Beach, it's, it's a big challenge. And I'm, this is not an area that I've been, I've been working in, but uh, it's certainly of interest to me and I'll keep asking those questions. So we find the right solution. Awesome, sounds great. So I think Mari, we can conclude our Q&A session. You got it, do you wanna launch our last poll? Yes, so our last poll is a quick one. One question, uh, two questions, sorry. <laughs> um, how would you rate today's webinar? And would you like to participate in an upcoming citizen science event? So we'll give you about 30 seconds quick. Let us know that we do really good. Would you think that we need to improve somewhere? And of course, we go ahead. Thank you, Alyssa. And while you all submit this poll questions, I just want to remind you all, well, you'll be able to access our, our recording. You'll be also able to access our PowerPoint presentation. So you can scan this QR code. It's going to take you to the Institute of Environment website. 
Um, under coastlines and oceans, you'll find the Miami-Dade Environmental Education Grant, all the information that you need to know. Um, and under events, you'll be able to uh, access all this information. And we also have the resources from Viviana. She has created this great guide um, for elevating envir environment sustainability. So you, it's a free guide that you can download. We have also a QR code to her website here, but it, her website is greenyourevents.com and you'll also be able to download her guide. All right, so we're at 80, 89%. I'm gonna, all right, we reached 90. So thank you everyone. It looks like everyone liked it. That's awesome. And I'm glad to hear that many of you are interested in attending our next citizen science events. Here are the results. So with that being said, I'm. It's already one, so I definitely want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been very exciting to learn so much about your experiences in our community. And we hope that everybody takes home some of the science and share them amongst your friends and maybe practice some of these in your next event. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.